Mark Rylance, the award-winning British actor and environmentalist, said in an interview recently, I feel like we've got to fall in love with nature again. We do incredible things for each other when we fall in love. And I love this quote because the home truth is that we protect what we love and we need that on this planet now more than ever. COP26, we got this. The podcast discussing the issues, ideas and debates behind the summit that will shape the future of our planet. Brought to you by the Australian National University and King's College London. Hello and welcome to this podcast, COP We Got This. It's a series in which we're going to prepare you for the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26. My name is Dr. Megan Bowman, and I am an Associate Professor in Law and also Director of the Climate Law and Governance Centre at King's College London. And my name is Dr. Will Grant, I'm from the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science at the Australian National University. So one of the reasons for doing this podcast um, in the lead up to COP26, we're going to cover off some of the key climate issues uh, as we progress toward the date of that event in November. And really, the issue that I think we need to put on the table up front is just how quickly climate change is progressing, how real it is becoming in our everyday lives, no matter where we are on the planet, it touches each of us. It was only a few years ago in 2015 that, so six years ago, that Mark Carney, who was the then governor of the Bank of England, spoke about climate change in the context of the role of markets and the economy in meeting the climate challenge. And he coined this phrase, the tragedy of the horizons. And what he meant by that was that the long-term nature of climate impacts was out of sync with the short-term nature of human decision-making and activity. So it was too hard for us to grasp the enormity of the problem because it just felt too far away. But what we're seeing, and it's only six years later, keep that in mind, is that climate change is manifesting right here, right now. And we have a tragedy on our doorstep. And in fact, it's walking into our lounge room and it's smashing stuff up as it goes. It's an unwelcome intruder, but it's one that we unwittingly invited into our homes a long time ago. I'm going to add to that, Megan. I think about the visceral nature of climate change right now. And I spoke to a fairly senior gentleman just recently, and uh, he said, I never thought I'd see climate change. But over and over again, around the world, country after country, we're seeing extreme events, changes in our ecosystems, changes in the environment around us that shows climate is hammering home right now. I'm here in uh, Canberra. Just 18 months ago, we lived through bushfires that we'd never seen before. We'd never seen anything like that before disappeared a little bit in memory when COVID hit. But I think we all around the world are seeing so much of the climate impacts right now. The danger is on our doorstep. Exactly. And I think what's made it a clear and present danger for us is that we're seeing these impacts in, in developed wealthy countries as much as developing countries. And that's a real wake up call for those in hegemonic decision making positions. So as you have clearly stated, we're seeing it hardcore in Australia. In the US, the West Coast is on fire at exactly the same time that the East Coast is in flood. Cities in Europe have also been practically washed away by flooding this summer. And of course, in places, you know, yeah, like Australia, it's, it's bushfires and also drought. CNN in America is saying climate change is far worse than expected and it can't be modelled. So this is a clear and present danger now. It's not just something happening over there or at some faraway point in time. And really, this is sort of bringing together key governments at all levels who are now forced to admit the existential need to act immediately.
Which brings us, I think, to what we want to do in this podcast series. One of the key things that we know is that we are running out of time to act on climate change. We're running out of time if we're going to keep the world below 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we don't take action soon, then we are looking at catastrophic impacts this decade, next decade, and throughout the century as the world gets warmer and warmer in far deadly and dangerous ways. Throughout this podcast, we want to cover a series of key topics that help us to understand what is happening in climate change, what is happening in climate diplomacy, and what is happening in climate adaptation as we lead up to the COP conference in Glasgow. We'll be looking at climate adaptation, climate diplomacy, the economics of climate action and the role of finance. In all of them, we want to understand what's going on and how can we come together to solve this. One of the key things also, Will, that we've been looking at is where is the positive message, where is the hope? As we've listed, we're you know, on track for um, disastrous future if we don't act immediately. But we're also beginning to see signs of positivity and hope as key and, and, and a real broad range of actors and sectors around the world begin to mobilise even in or perhaps because of government inaction. So civil society looking at extinction rebellion, youth climate strikes, courts and judges, litigation, holding governments and corporations and financial actors to account for their part in addressing climate change. The private sector, believe it or not, has many different proposals in this space and beginning to act again voluntarily even despite government inaction. And even the media, you know, Murdoch media, staunchly anti-climate thus far, has said it will start advocating for net zero by 2050 in the lead up to COP26. So there are reasons for hope and positivity and particularly from these non-state actor groups that you mentioned there, Will. Now, before we dive into some of the experts that we'll be talking to throughout this podcast series, Megan, I just want to, I just want to start with a, a question that we'll probably ask many of the people that we talk to. You said there are signs for hope. Are you personally feeling optimistic about where we're at in terms of climate change? I think we're at a, I think we're at a pivotal point. There's no doubt about that. The importance of COP26 plays into this discussion here because it is the most important climate summit since the landmark Paris Agreement was agreed at COP21 back in 2015. So in November this year, we'll be asking, um, are we on track to deliver the Paris Agreement objective of staying within the two-degree guardrail? And we already know that we are not. So the question is actually, what more do we need to do and how can it be done? So I am... I feel positive that on the back of the heels of the kind of natural disasters in uh, wealthy developed countries that we've already pointed out, that those decision makers will come together and be really motivated to make something happen at COP, to be able to review the commitments and strengthen their ambition. I think that's a really interesting point because, yes, we've had a lot of climate summits before. But uh, this is one of the first big events in the climate scene since the catastrophic, world-changing shocks of the COVID pandemic. We've had something happen to the world that has changed how we have lived our lives, changed how we've viewed the environment, changed how we've viewed the cities and towns around us. Now, I'm not saying that it, it's, a, it's a positive. COVID was obviously a catastrophic, horrible thing for the world. But if there is one big silver lining, it is the silver lining that says we can change society fast. If we need to, if we need to, we can change what's going on. I take a big sign of uh, optimism and hope in what we've done recently and the fact that we have come together and done good things for society. Maybe we can do them on climate front. And I think that's a really important point, Will, because COVID really has shaken us all in unforeseen ways. But unlike COVID, there's no quarantining from global warming and there is no vaccine. So we really need to step up. And it raises ethical issues of human responsibility, of course. I mean, COVID only affected humans, but the climate crisis impacts all life on this earth, not just humans, and all the life support systems upon which we rely, but that have salience and sentience in their own right. So it creates that knowledge, creates responsibility for humans to avert the tragedy we can see coming on the horizon. 
that coupled with the fact that during this COVID crisis, we have managed to mobilise so quickly does indeed give us both impetus for acting and some hope that we can. Throughout this series, we're going to be talking to some amazing experts, scientists, uh, researchers from a whole range of different fields who understand deeply what is going on in the climate change and climate change negotiation space. The first one we're going to kick off is a conversation that I had with Professor Mark Howden, uh, the Director of the Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions at the Australian National University. So Mark has helped develop both the national and international greenhouse gas inventories that are a fundamental part of the Paris Agreement and has assessed sustainable ways to reduce emissions. He's been a major contributor to the IPCC since 1991 with roles in the second, third, fourth, fifth and now sixth assessment reports and shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with the other IPCC participants and Al Gore. I had a great chat with Mark. We covered a key number of things in terms of what is the IPCC, what is the COP process and what he's looking to come out of the back end of Glasgow. Hi, Mark. Welcome to COP. We got this. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the climate science and the institutions that are leading up to this conference. So firstly, you're heavily involved in the IPCC. Uh, can you tell us briefly, what is the IPCC and what work do they do? The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the governmental panel component reflects that it's actually managed by the governments and they're the receivers of the information. And in doing that, they're actually the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change parties. And the scientists who participate in the IPCC are then advisors to the governments of the world in relation to climate change. So the scientists uh, write the reports um, and then with the governments, they approve the summary for policymakers as a co-design process. So in the end, this is a report which is both owned by the scientific community and owned by the governments. There are different working groups within the IPCC. Uh, what areas do they cover? So we've had pretty much the same structure for a long time. There's actually four components to the IPCC. Um, there's working group one, which deals with the climate science. That's like understanding the atmospheric uh, science, the oceanographic science and how the carbon budget and cycle works. Then there's uh, the working group two, which deals with the climate impacts and adaptation side of things. So how does climate change impact on the things that we value and what are the responses we can take to reduce risks or take advanced opportunities? And then there's working group three, which looks at the emission reduction options. So how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? What are the good pathways? What are the not so good pathways? pros and cons. And then there's the last component, which most people forget about, which is essentially the greenhouse gas inventories side of things. So it's uh, the advisory body, which uh, looks at how to construct greenhouse gas inventories so we can track how much greenhouse gas each country is producing. Well, we'll do our best not to forget about greenhouse gas inventories. They sound super important, super important. Um, I know that there was an IPCC report a few months ago. Was that uh, overarching all of them or from one of the working groups? That was from working group one. So it dealt very much with the climate science. It's not intended to uh, delve into the risk domain nor the emission reduction domain. And, uh, and, but it was nevertheless, it's a really important report uh, because it, it really does frame out what's already happening to our climate as a result of human influence and what might happen in the future under different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's really core information for a lot of governments. And then of course, it, it works into things like uh, how extreme events might be changing and how they may change in the future and the same for sea level rise, you know, how that's already going up and what might happen in the future. I remember a lot of the reporting around uh, characterized it as code red, code red. What was new about this report or what was different that uh, a lot of people talking about it as super serious uh, in terms of the history of IPCC reports? Some people did call it a code red. I, I tend to avoid that language, uh, but it was nevertheless a really important report. The big, big difference here, I think, is just the, simply the level of confidence that the science community has about, about attributing observed change to human influence, uh, but also constraining future projections. So we can say with greater confidence, 
if we produce this much greenhouse gases and go on this emissions trajectory, it's a much, much more constrained and accurate forecast of what might happen in the future. What change to allow us to do that? Is it, is it simply better measuring or better modelling or what's happened there? Well, since the last IPCC Working Group 1 report, we've had eight years more data. And so we've, uh, and a lot's happened in those eight years. You know, we've had huge changes in terms of climate across the globe, you know, record temperature after record temperature. And so there's eight years of, of really important data. We've also got much better ways of collecting that data. So, uh, you know, new ways of collecting the atmospheric data and the satellite data and the ocean um, data and better ways of analysing that. So, so bringing together that data in a much more integrated way. And importantly, in this particular report, uh, we did what we call multiple lines of evidence. So we were linking in the historical observations uh, with the future projections uh, using often supercomputer type models um, and with the fossil record. So the records going back thousands and up to millions of years. And we were putting those together um, so that they essentially support each other in terms of providing better estimates of what might be going on and what might change in the future. Great. How, how does the IPCC then feed into the COP process? And you might have to give us a, an acronym explainer for COP and then how IPCC fits into there. So the COP is the conference of parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So essentially it's the governments who engage in climate change discussions. And the IPCC essentially is the main source of science advice to those governments going into the conference of parties. And, uh, and that does it partly because what we have within the IPCC is by far the most comprehensive science synthesis. And the very nature of it is a, a synthesis. There's no one author who predominates. There's no one discipline that dominates. It actually brings together a huge amount of different um, types of reports of types of knowledge. So, for example, the Working Group 1 report that uh, was released about a month ago had 14,000 references of scientific papers in that. That's a lot. Yeah, so it's really, really pulling together a huge amount of information. And so that provides a really good basis for governments to make science-based, evidence-based decisions. Now, um, in terms of this cycle, we've got the Working Group 1 report that's just come out. Next is Working Group 2 in February, then Working Group 3, which is the Emission Reduction Report, and that happens in March. And then we have the Synthesis Report around about this time next year. And that then feeds into the what's called the Global Stock Take of the UN Framework Convention. And that is essentially an assessment of you know, how well are we going in terms of emission reduction uh, does the science say we need to beef things up or um, change how we're approaching this in some ways? So that global stock take will then inform the next ramping up of commitments uh, by governments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, okay. So I, I, in the landscape of his big climate uh, talks, so we had Kyoto, uh, Copenhagen, uh, Paris, uh, are those after the stock take reports? Because I was just wondering as you were talking there, you know, Glasgow coming up is after Working Group 1's report from the IPCC, but we, we don't have the impacts report coming till next year. So we'll be taking account of those in the next COP after Glasgow? That's, that's right. That's the intention. And so, so we have a, a sequence of, of reports and they, in a sense, will fit into the subsequent uh, Conference of Parties meeting. And uh, this, this is the first global stock take uh, because the global stock take was established as part of the Paris Agreement and it was scheduled to be in 2023. And so um, this is the first time we've really uh, gone into that stock take, which means that everyone's pretty much figuring out what it is and what it's going to involve and, and how, to, how to have effective input into that. Okay, so based on the IPCC report that you know well, and thinking about Glasgow in November. What are you hoping to see emerge from Glasgow at the end of the COP? Well, I think the th big three things from my perspective is firstly, uh, the ramping up of commitments. So we've already seen a whole range of countries uh, indicate uh, increased commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so there'll be pressure on other countries to do that at Glasgow. Secondly, I think there's a, a lot of works yet to be done to make sure that the international carbon trading arrangements uh, are done on a 
uh, an evidence-based and a transparent, accountable set of arrangements. And so, so if we have carbon trading across national borders, uh, that it's it's uh, it's secure that we don't have double counting. So um, you know, it's carbon emission sequestration um, isn't isn't uh, counted in more than one country. And the third big one for me is uh, the finance ad uh, agenda, particularly adaptation finance. So that's I think more and more developing countries are saying uh, we really need a lot of help here to ensure that we're adapting effectively to climate change, that we're building the adaptive capacity and that we have the appropriate techniques that can apply. We'll have to we'll have to make a bit of a scoreboard for the end of COP and see if they have addressed all of your laundry list of desires. But I want to just, before we close this out, just pivot a little bit to how you got into climate change research and how you got into this position where you are deep in the the bowels, the happy places of the IPCC? Yeah. So if I remember, my first uh, thing that I wrote on climate change was when I was a high school student. And, and that's an embarrassingly long time ago. No, that was basically 2005, wasn't it? <laughs> and I, I wish. But uh, it was... Um, and then, and then uh, at, at university, we covered climate change in a broad sense. My first significant science uh, excursion into this was uh, in 1987, where I was a co-author on a paper in the first uh, climate change conference that Australia wrote. Um, and then when I came to Canberra in 1990, uh, I uh, observed that there was actually a real big gap in terms of greenhouse gas inventories, you know, the ability to um, monitor uh, what uh, what in greenhouse gases we were producing. And so, so I helped establish the Australian greenhouse inventories and then the international ones, which included the IPCC. So I actually was a, um, a, a significant uh, contributor to the development of those greenhouse inventories, particularly in the agriculture space. And, uh, and so, so that was my, one of my first IPCC roles. And at the same time, I was engaged in the second assessment report of the IPCC. And subsequent to that, I've been in the third, you know, the, so I was there in the second, then I've been in the third, fourth, fifth, and now sixth assessment reports and a range of special reports that IPCC has produced. So, so I've had a fairly continuous uh, involvement in IPCC since 1990, and uh, which, which I think there's only one other person who's actually had that sort of length of, of engagement. And I think importantly that, that just because you engage in the IPCC on one process doesn't actually give you any particular edge in terms of being chosen the next time round. Um, because they're effectively independent processes. And so, um, so it's, it's been, you know, an, an incredibly fortunate, you know, sequence of, of arrangements where I've been able to contribute to what I think is one of the great success stories of science in terms of uh, engaging with and informing policy. And, and, and it's, in my view, the single biggest science experiment that we've ever had in terms of science policy. And, and I think it's been greatly successful. Wow. That's, uh, that's, Fantastic. What, what, what drives you in this space? I can understand, you know, seeing this, uh, this great science governance organisation coming together, not always the thing that uh, wakes people in the middle of the night, seeing how, how they can contribute to science governance. And I'm glad that there are people like you that, that very much think that way. What's, what's your driver in this space that you think back in high school, you wrote that paper on climate change? Yeah, it's been a, a view that, uh, you know, key driver for me is making science useful. And uh, so science, if it just sits on a shelf or, or you know, informs other scientists, um, it doesn't really cut it for me. I, I like doing both rigorous science, uh, you know, science which is reproducible, which is um, really robust, but at the same time ensuring that it's, it's useful and used by people, which means that it's not just a ma means of casting it as, as a, um, in a way that makes it uh, usable, but it's actually engaging with people and doing the co-design that actually gets it implemented. And so it actually makes the world a better place rather than just prospectively making the world a better place. I was just going to say one last question, but you definitely, you sound in your voice already hopeful. Is that right? Are you hopeful about either the COP process or in general about climate action? Look, we, we are making progress. Uh, it's not going to be fast enough to offset a lot of, real big problems for the world. And we're already seeing that now, um, fingerprints of climate change on extreme events. Uh, but we are starting to move. And 
and we are starting to see governments move and business move and and we're seeing a amazing amount of uptake of climate change concern and desire for action amongst the public so for example in australia consistently 90 percent of australians when surveyed say they want more action on climate change that's an extraordinary win for science you know that we can actually say that 90 percent of australians actually get the science of climate change they get the core messages of climate change and i think that's a really positive thing the thing we haven't done is convert that desire for action and the need for action into action and so so we've got a bit of an action gap and largely that's at the political level rather than at the individual or science institutional level. Fantastic, Mark. Well, hopefully we'll see all of your wish list from COP coming true. But hopefully again, we'll get you back in and talk more on uh, COP. We got this to explore more about how the IPCC is bringing this science to the world and we're going to take action. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, Will. We're joined now by Dr. Tamsin Edwards. Tamsin is a climate scientist specializing in quantifying the uncertainties of climate model predictions, particularly for the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheet contributions to sea level rise. She's a lead author of the IPCC's sixth assessment report and a contributing author to the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, which was published in 2019. Tamsin regularly advises the UK government on sea level rise, climate science and science communication and provides expert comment to international media and business. She's an award-winning communicator, including through Twitter, her blog for the Public Library of Science and articles for The Guardian. She's also the director of the MSC Climate Change, Environment Science and Policy and leads the King's Climate Hub. Welcome to the podcast, Tamsin. Thank you for having me. Look, let's dive in. Um, How are you feeling in the lead up to COP right now? Uh, if I'm honest, I'm tired because there is an incredible interest, which I'm very grateful for, in um, two things. One is public talks about climate change, uh, which I'm doing a lot of, and also a demand to do our master's program in climate change, to retrain and uh, to change the world because of things like COP and greater awareness um, since the Paris Agreement uh, over the last few years. And so it's just an incredibly hectic time, but it's, it's wonderful to be buoyed up by all this incredible um, hunger for climate knowledge and, you know, ways to kind of change the world. Fantastic. Thanks, James. And that, I think, raises the question, how do we communicate the science now? I mean, particularly you've mentioned students, and I'm interested in, in how, how we teach students now about these issues um, in terms of the urgency, in terms of the science Um, do we need to change the the way that we teach? Do we need to change the way that we message? And I guess what flows on from that in relation to climate communication is how do you particularly sort of communicate the science to a range of decision makers? And I think that's not just policymakers. I think that's also professionals like lawyers and financiers, as well as everyday people like us. So how do you do the communication? It's a great question because I think fundamentally, I think it's really important to not Um, hugely change the content of what you're saying to different audiences. I've seen scientists, for example, certainly back in the day when I first started out, you know, kind of joke to each other within scientific conferences about the, you know, crap output that their model was producing or, you know, the flaws in their model or, or the data, and then present public talks about the sort of utter perfect confidence in, in climate model predictions. And I, I understand where that comes from, that you, you deal with the kind of nuts and bolts of your day-to-day, you know, struggles of trying to improve the science. And then you want to present the sort of more polished version to the public and inspire confidence. But I think that can also be a bit dangerous if people kind of sense that disconnect between how you talk to each other internally um, and how you talk externally. So I think in terms of students, the public, business, lawyers, NGOs, in a sense, I try to make the content pretty similar, but obviously the nuances of, of how you communicate and the tone can be quite different, even across different years. So the uh, of students, so the master's students, our master's students come from a really wide range of backgrounds. So some of them have studied science and geography. Some of them have not really studied any climate science or climate policy at all. Uh, they're very enthusiastic, but they, they really need to be taken from the beginning, but very quickly through to the cutting edge. 
So we have this module called Fundamentals of Climate Change, which I keep saying to people is really badly named because actually it's fundamental issues of climate change. We don't teach the greenhouse effect. We teach why it's been so challenging to tackle climate change, um, both in assessing the scientific evidence and, and acting on it in terms of different people's values and the complexity of the problem. Uh, to kind of rapidly get people away from this idea of if only we tell more people about the problem, then it'll all be okay. You know, this kind of slightly simplistic way, I guess, of, of thinking about, well, just more information and more people working on it will be enough on its own rather than really appreciating those big challenges. Uh, whereas the first year undergraduates, I might do a bit more of a sort of, we do teach the greenhouse effect and we do to give a bit more of a, a plain kind of version. But then as they go through the years of their undergraduate degree, we teach them more of that critical thinking, more of that complexity of the problem, more of how, um, how these different values that people have and the, the systemic problems that feed into climate change and, and our solutions, um, what makes all of that really difficult. And then, and then with the public, I think for me, what's, what's different, I suppose, about the public is that they're not always um, a willing audience. So your students have come there to learn some climate change usually, or actually the first years, it's a compulsory module, but they're, they're fairly willing. Um, the public, they, they are, are not a captive audience. They don't have to listen to you. So there's an element of where you have to be more engaging, of course, more interesting and more imaginative and creative in the way you talk. But also there are really important things around tone. And there's a lot of a disagreement, I think, in climate change about how to talk about this. And there are a lot of people who think that fear is the way to go. And, you know, there's, there's some evidence that fear can work with some groups, that it can galvanize, um, whether it's through uh, fear for their own survival or whether it's fear on behalf of others, other people in the future, other people around the world. But in general, people tell me that they, they like the fact that, um, that I and, and, and many climate scientists uh, try to talk about this in a fairly calm way uh, and a fairly hopeful way uh, with sort of you know positive kind of directions for the future rather than kind of bang them over the head with we can't do this we, we you know we mustn't do this it's all hopeless and, and partly that's scientifically wrong I mean there's no single threshold but over which climate change is suddenly lost and um, before which climate change is won you know it's a it's a spectrum and similarly kind of businesses and lawyers NGOs or the people who are either working in organizations that are already having to deal with climate change or, or thinking about their approach to the risks of climate change or the low carbon transition, or those who are just starting to think, oh, maybe we should think about this, maybe we should tackle climate related risks. Again, I think they appreciate that sort of quite sort of calm, you know, um, sort of straight down the line, like here are the predictions, you know, Here's the scale of the challenge. A net zero target in, in 2050 is only the, the beginning. Actually, things have to start, you know, tomorrow for you to get to net zero. And just laying it out in that sort of actually sometimes quite unemotional way. You know, some, some groups and, and some public audiences will really respond to emotion, but sometimes business leaders and so on, they just want the kind of the more plain speaking version. So, yeah, so tone can definitely change across audiences. I think that's really important, and I know actually that you've that you've spoken to a number of different groups throughout your career about the climate science, um, you know, ranging from lawyers to students, and it's incredible work, Tams, and it's wonderful to hear you speak about it. I think that feeds nicely into the next question I want to ask. I want to revisit the theme that we open this podcast, this series with, which is we protect what we love, and it's time we fell in love with nature and the planet, you know, again, or or perhaps even for the first time. Is there room for that kind of sentiment, do you think, in the science community? If not, do you think we're at a time in science or in the world generally where we need to rethink our approach? Brené Brown, is a, the, the sociologist, might call this daring leadership, you know, the heart of daring leadership, and that we need that kind of leadership now to take us beyond our comfort zone, to, to get kind of radical, because what we're pre being presented with challenges that are radical and we need to respond in new ways. Is there room for that, do you think? Absolutely. And different scientists and people who work in the sphere of climate change will have different comfort levels about what they want to talk about in, the, in terms of their personal views or their emotions or whatever. I think one group I didn't talk about in terms of the public is, um, is perhaps the, the more sceptical end of things. Um, so 
So the more right leaning, uh, particularly in, in sort of Anglophone countries, the US, the UK and, and Australia, uh, Canada, where the, the, you know, there are that sort of end of the political spectrum where it has become very politicized tend to be more skeptical of, um, you know, science, media and so on. And I think love of nature is, you know, has been shown to be a very powerful message to these groups who are wanting to preserve and conserve and, and for whom nature may be extremely important part of their day-to-day lives. Uh, they may live in the country, they may work in the country, they may depend on farming and forestry. And these groups are absolutely, I think, uh, that going to respond to people who also love nature. I mean, I, you know, I work a lot with glaciologists, uh, of course, working on the ice sheets and glacier predictions for the future. And, you know, they are great lovers of nature. They go out on glaciers, go hiking, incredibly tough group of people. There's a great book, actually, I'm just reading by Gemma Wadham at Bristol University, uh, Ice Rivers, I think it's called. And she talks about her incredible uh, field work out on glaciers where, you know, is t- one of the toughest women <laughs> I think I, I've heard of. Um, and, and geographers in general, you know, always loving to get out and hike and get muddy and get in, into rivers in welly boots and all this kind of stuff. So I think lots of climate scientists and people who, who care about climate change started out by loving nature and loving animal programs. For example, I love David Attenborough and a UK program called The Really Wild Show with Chris Packham and others. And you know, that was what got me into nature and preserving the planet. It was save the whale and save the ozone layer. And, you know, we all have those values, you know, usually. Um, Samson, can, can I ask on this? I think one of the things that is definitely underscoring so much of what we're doing in this podcast is understanding how our values motivate our efforts in the climate space. And values, values are what motivates everyone. But I know that historically it's been quite tricky for scientists to put their values out there on the ticket to say, you know, this is why I am doing this. You've just spoken about a group there that, you know, speaks of love of nature, but historically so many have not felt comfortable doing this. What can we do to help scientists to talk more in terms that reference what their values are and why we're doing this in terms of uh, the whole COP process? Yeah. I mean, I suppose there's an overarching problem, which is that, scientists are trained throughout their careers to not talk like humans in terms of journal articles and so on. It's incredibly sort of formalized uh, and and takes you away from the personal. Statisticians are a bit better. Um, And of course, scientists are not the only people who should be communicating. Did you just say statisticians are a bit better? Yeah, because often, um, I mean, maybe it's maybe it's the statisticians that I know that uh, work in um, uh, Bayesian statistics. Yeah, no, because it's quite um, it's quite it's a field that really acknowledges and puts forward the subjective. So they will say, you know, I do this, I make this judgment. We, you know, it's it is it can be a little more like a, like one of those old fashioned science papers where they really are writing kind of as the person doing the work rather than it was done, you know, this kind of passive voice, which I hate, which you see in scientific articles. So yeah, statisticians tend to take a bit more ownership, or the, the ones that I know that work in this Bayesian field, this sort of subjective field. Um, it was a bit of a sideline, but I think, you know, we spend all our careers learning how to not talk like humans. And, um, and there's a security in that, in terms of our professional development and our um, impressing our peers and sort of fitting into that thing. And you, you do often find that it's, it can either be the very most early career researchers who, who haven't got uh, ingrained into that, or the most senior who feel comfortable enough to break free of it, that can be actually the best, I think, at talking simply about their work. And that, that is about confidence. And, and you do get sort of shot down slightly if you don't sound clever enough. You know, people talk about dumbing down, my least favourite phrase, or... Uh, you know, there's a kind of snobbery around making things inaccessible. So you have to have the confidence to say, well, that's nonsense. Of course, we want to make this accessible. I've just been preparing a, a 10 minute talk I'm giving on Thursday to um, a general audience that it, it could be quite big. I think it's it's um, being streamed on Facebook and it's sort of around the music industry and climate change and the audience in the room, I think, will be quite an interesting group of, of music people. And um, I've I've spent hours and hours writing that talk, right? It takes a long time to write something that's really clear and simple and has some of that emotion. It starts with a video of the, um, the Lytton fire in Canada this year that destroyed most of the village as a, as a kind of way to, to pull people into that, that story. 
uh, but it but it takes time and it takes that sort of confidence to to get away from academia and 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 you have to start listening to people what you know you don't just sort of say well here are all my facts I'm going to tell you you have to start asking people what they want to know who do they trust where do they get their information and why uh, what are their stumbling blocks on things uh, and and genuinely believe that their views are valid and what I mean by that is not necessarily that climate science is all wrong but the way that they have come to that conclusion is an understandable one because you know they're humans like anyone else they have their sources of information that they get uh, which you know we all know that the algorithms and the you know geographical limitations and the cultural groups that we're in they lead us down different paths you know of being kind of more liberal or more conservative and we have to acknowledge that there is a good reason why the person disagrees with you and um and then actually try to figure out what that is and whether you can you can see each other as as human and that you can see each other as at least partly right or at least being valid in having come to those views perfect thank you so much uh tamsin i think we can wrap it up there actually um and i know that there are many listeners who identify with exactly what you've spoken i mean i know you know, coming from a legal background in the law school having been a practicing lawyer those exact issues um, reflect tensions within our discipline and our profession as well. And I'm sure, you know, across many professions and disciplines, and it's, it's really great to hear you speak about maybe it's the, it's the, it's the most young, the most naive and the most experienced who maybe don't give a, you know, a a flying fruit bat anymore. Um, Those who care the most and those who care the least um, who, who are able to actually be human and speak human. And, uh, and, I, and my personal feeling is that we need, to, we need to spread that across a much larger range of demographics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, it's, it, it makes total sense. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you. This is a special production by the Australian National University and King's College London. Our producers were Lamise Kazak, James Bagley and Julius Stoposka, with editing from Rachel Wall and music from Dean Smith.